All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remark Chapter 1 We are at rest five miles behind the front. Yesterday we were relieved, and now our bellies are full of beef and haricot beans. We are satisfied and at peace. Each man has another mess tin full for the evening, and what is more, there is a double ration of sausage and bread. That puts a man in fine trim. We have not had such luck as this for a long time. The cook, with his carroty head, is begging us to eat. He beckons with his ladle to everyone that passes, and spoons him out a great dollop. He does not see how he can empty his stew pot in time for coffee. Yaden and Muller have produced two wash basins and had them filled up to the brim as a reserve. In Yaden, this is a veracity. In Muller, it is foresight. Where Yadin puts it all is a mystery, for he is and always will be as thin as a rake. What's more important still is the issue of a double ration of smokes. Ten cigars, twenty cigarettes, and two quids of chew per man. Now that is decent. I have exchanged my chewing tobacco with Kaczynski for his cigarettes, which means I have forty altogether. That's enough for a day. It is true we have no right to this windfall. The Prussian is not so generous. We have only a miscalculation to thank for it. Fourteen days ago, we had to go up and relieve the front line. It was fairly quiet on our sector, so the quartermaster who remained in the rear had requisitioned the usual quantity of rations and provided for the full company of 150 men. But on the last day, an astonishing number of English heavies opened up on us with high explosive, drumming ceaselessly on our position, so that we suffered severely and came back only 80 strong. Last night we moved back and settled down to get a good sleep for once. Kaczynski is right when he says it would not be such a bad war if only one could get a little more sleep. In the line we have had next to none, and fourteen days is a long time at one stretch. It was noon before the first of us crawled out of our quarters. Half an hour later every man had his mess tin, and we gathered at the cookhouse, which smelt greasy and nourishing. At the head of the queue, of course, were the hungriest. Little Albert Kropp, the clearest thinker among us, and therefore only a lance corporal. Muller, who still carries his school textbooks with him, dreams of examinations, and during a bombardment mutters propositions in physics. Lair, who wears a full beard and has a preference for the girls from the officers' brothels. He swears that they are obliged by an army order to wear silk chemises and to bathe before entertaining guests of the rank of captain upwards. And as the fourth, Myself, Paul Bama, all four are nineteen years of age, and all four joined up from the same class as volunteers for the war. Close behind us were our friends. Yaden, a skinny locksmith of our own age, the biggest eater of the company. He sits down to eat as thin as a grasshopper, and gets up as big as a bug in the family way. High Westus, of the same age, a peat digger, who can easily hold a ration loaf in his hand and say, Guess what I've got in my fist? Then Dieterine, a peasant who thinks of nothing but his farmyard and his wife. And finally, Stanislaus Kaczynski, the leader of our group. Shrewd, cunning, and hard-bitten. Forty years of age, with a face of soil, blue eyes, bent shoulders, and a remarkable nose for dirty weather, good food, and soft jobs. Our gang formed the head of the queue before the cookhouse. We were growing impatient, for the cook paid no attention to us. Finally, Kaczynski called to him. Say, Heinrich, open up the soup kitchen. Anyone can see the beans are done. He shook his head sleepily. You must all be here first. Yaden grinned. We are all here. The sergeant cook still took no notice. That may do for you, he said. But where are the others? They won't be fed by you today. They're either in the dressing station or pushing up daisies. The cook was quite disconcerted as the facts dawned on him. He was staggered. And I have cooked for one hundred and fifty men. Crop poked him in the ribs. Then for once we'll have enough. Come on, begin. Suddenly a vision came over Yaden. His sharp, mousy features began to shine. His eyes grew small with cunning. His jaws twitched, and he whispered hoarsely, Man, and you've got bread for one hundred and fifty men, too, eh? The sergeant cook nodded, absent-minded, and bewildered. 
Jaden seized him by the tunic. And sausage? Ginger nodded again. Yaden's chaps quivered. Tobacco, too? Yes, everything. Jaden beamed. What a bean feast. That's all for us. Each man gets... Wait a bit. Yes, practically two issues. Then Ginger stirred himself and said, That won't do. We got excited and began to crowd around. Why won't that do, you old carrot? demanded Kaczynski. Eighty men can't have what is meant for a hundred and fifty. We'll soon show you, growled Moeller. I don't care about the stew, but I can only issue rations for eighty men, persisted Ginger. Kaczynski got angry. You might be generous for once. You haven't drawn food for eighty men. You've drawn it for the second company. Good. Let's have it, then. We are the second company. We began to jostle the fellow. No one felt kindly toward him, for it was his fault that the food often came up to us in line too late and cold. Under shell fire, he wouldn't bring his kitchen up near enough, so that our soup carriers had to go much farther than those of other companies. Now, Bull, for the first company, is a much better fellow. He is as fat as a hamster in winter, but he trundles his pots when it comes to that, right up to the very front line. We were in just the right mood, and there certainly would have been a dust-up if our company commander had not appeared. He informed himself of this dispute and only remarked, Yes, we did have heavy losses yesterday. He glanced into the Dixie. The beans look good. Ginger nodded. Cooked with meat and fat. The lieutenant looked at us. He knew what we were thinking. And he knew many other things, too, because he came to the company as a non-com and was promoted from the ranks. He lifted the lid from the Dixie again and sniffed. Then, passing on, he said, Bring me a plateful. Serve out all the rations. We can do with them. Ginger looked sheepish as Yaden danced round him. It doesn't cost you anything. Anyone would think the quartermaster store belonged to him. And now get on with it, you old blubber sticker. Don't you miscount, either. You be hanged, spat out Ginger. When things get beyond him, he throws up the sponge altogether. He just goes to pieces. As if to show that all things were equal to him, on his own free will, he issued an additional half pound of synthetic honey to each man. Today is wonderfully good. The mail has come, and almost every man has a few letters and papers. We stroll over to the meadow behind the billets. Krupp has the round lid of a margarine tub under his arm. On the right side of the meadow, a large common latrine has been built, a roofed and durable construction. But that is for recruits, who as yet have not learned how to make the most of whatever comes their way. We want something better. Scattered about everywhere, there are separate, individual boxes for the same purpose. They are square, neat boxes, with wooden sides all round, and have unimpeachably satisfactory seats. On the sides are hand grips, enabling one to shift them about. We move three together in a ring and sit down comfortably, and it will be two hours before we get up again. I well remember how embarrassed we were as recruits in barracks when we had to use the general latrine. There were no doors, and twenty men sat side by side as in a railway carriage, so that they could be reviewed all at one glance, for soldiers must always be under supervision. Since then we have learned better than to be shy about such trifling immodesties. In time, things far worse than that come easy to us. Here in the open air, though, the business is entirely a pleasure. I no longer understand why we should always have shied at these things before. They are, in fact, just as natural as eating and drinking. We might perhaps have paid no particular attention to them had they not figured so large in our experience, nor been such novelties in our minds. To the old hands, they had long been a mere matter of course. The soldier is on friendlier terms than other men with his stomach and intestines. Three-quarters of his vocabulary is derived from these regions, and they give an intimate flavor to expressions of his greatest joys as well as his deepest indignation. It is impossible to express oneself in any other way so cleverly and pithily. Our families and teachers will be shocked when we go home. But here it is the universal language. Enforced publicity has in our eyes restored the character of complete innocence to all these things. More than that, they are so much a matter of course that their comfortable performance is fully as much enjoyed as the plane of a safe top running flush. Not for nothing was the word latrine rumor invented. These places are the regimental gossip shop, 
and common rooms. We feel ourselves, for the first time, being better off than in any palatial white-tiled convenience. There it can be hygienic. Here it is beautiful. These are wonderfully carefree hours. Over us is the blue sky. On the horizon float the bright yellow sunlit observation balloons and the many little white clouds of the anti-aircraft shells. Often they rise in a sheath as they fall after an airman. We hear the muffled rumble of the front only as a very distant thunder. Bumblebees droning by quite drown it. Around us stretches the flowery meadow. The grasses sway their tall spears. The white butterflies flutter around and float in the soft, warm wind of the late summer. We read letters and newspapers and smoke. We take off our caps and lay them down beside us. The wind plays with our hair. It plays with our words and thoughts. The three boxes stand in the midst of the glowing red field poppies. We set the lid of the margarine tub on our knees and so have a good table for a game of scat. Krupp has the cards with him. After every misere avert, we have a round of nap. One could sit like this forever. The notes of an accordion float across the billets. Often we lay aside the cards and look about us. One of us will say, Well, boys, or, It was a near thing that time. And for a moment we fall silent. There is in each of us a feeling of constraint. We are all sensible of it. It needs no words to communicate it. It might easily have happened that we should not be sitting here on our boxes today. It came damn near to that. And so everything is new and brave. Red poppies and good food. Cigarettes and summer breeze. Krupp asks, Anyone seen Kimmerick lately? He's up at St. Joseph's, I tell him. Moeller explains he has a flesh wound in his thigh. A good blighty. We decide to go and see him this afternoon. Krupp pulls out a letter. Cantorak sends you all his best wishes. We laugh. Moeller throws his cigarette away and says, I wish he was here. Cantorak had been our schoolmaster, a stern little man in a gray tailcoat, with a face like a shrew mouse. He was about the same size as Corporal Himmelstoss, the terror of Klosterberg. It is very queer that the unhappiness of the world is so often brought on by small men. They are so much more energetic and uncompromising than the big fellows. I have always taken good care to keep out of sections with small company commanders. They are mostly confounded little martinets. During drill time, Cantorak gave us long lectures, until the whole of our class went, under his shepherding, to the district commandant and volunteered. I can see him now, as he used to glare at us through his spectacles, and say in a moving voice, Won't you join up, comrades? These teachers always carry their feelings, ready in their waistcoat pockets, and trot them out by the hour. But we didn't think of that then. There was, indeed, one of us who hesitated, and did not want to fall into line. That was Joseph Bem, a plump, homely fellow. But he did allow himself to be persuaded. Otherwise, he would have been ostracized, and perhaps more of us thought as he did. But no one could very well stand out, because at that time, even one's parents were ready with the word, coward. No one would have the vaguest idea what we were in for. The wisest were just the poor and simple people. They knew the war to be a misfortune, whereas those who were better off, and should have been able to see more clearly what the consequences would be, were beside themselves with joy. Kaczynski said that was a result of their upbringing. It made them stupid. And what Kat said, he had thought about. Strange to say, Bem was one of the first to fall. He got hit in the eye during an attack, and we left him lying for dead. We couldn't bring him with us because we had to come back helter-skelter. In the afternoon, suddenly, we heard him call, and saw him crawling about in no man's land. He had only been knocked unconscious. Because he could not see, and was mad with pain, he failed to keep under cover, and so was shot down before anyone could go and fetch him. Naturally, we couldn't blame Canarac for this. Where would the world be if we brought everyone to book? There were thousands of Cantoracs, all of whom were convinced they were acting for the best. In a way, that cost them nothing. And that is why they let us down so badly. For us lads of eighteen, they ought to have been mediators and guides to the world of maturity, the world of work, of duty, of culture, of progress, to the future, 
We often made fun of them and played jokes on them, but in our hearts we trusted them. The idea of authority, which they represented, was associated in our minds with a greater insight and a more humane wisdom. But the first death we saw shattered this belief. We had to recognize that our generation was more to be trusted than theirs. They surpassed us only in phrases and in cleverness. The first bombardment showed us our mistake, and under it the world as they had taught it to us broke in pieces. While they continued to write and talk, we saw the wounded and dying. While they taught that duty to one's country is the greatest thing, we already knew that death throes are stronger. But for all that, we were no mutineers, no deserters, no cowards. They were very free with all these expressions. We loved our country as much as they. We went courageously into every action. But also, we distinguished the false from true. We had suddenly learned to see, and we saw there was nothing of their world left. We were all at once terribly alone, and alone we must see it through. Before going over to see Kimmerick, we pack up his things. We will need them on the way back. In the dressing station there is great activity. It reeks as ever of carbolic pus and sweat. We are accustomed to a great deal in the billets, but this makes us feel faint. We ask for Kimmerick. He lies in a large room and receives us with feeble expressions of joy and helpless agitation. While he was unconscious, someone had stolen his watch. Muller shakes his head. I always told you that nobody should carry as good a watch as that. Muller is rather crude and tactless. Otherwise, he would hold his tongue. For anybody can see that Kimrick will never come out of this place again. Whether he finds his watch or not will make no difference. At the most, one will only be able to send it to his people. How goes it, Franz? asked Krupp. Kimrich's head sinks. Not so bad. But I have such a damn pain in my foot. We look at his bed covering. His leg lies under a wire basket. The bed covering arches over it. I kick Muller in the shin, for he is just about to tell Kimmerich what the orderlies told us outside, that Kimmerich has lost his foot. The leg is amputated. He looks ghastly, yellow and wan. In his face there are already the strained lines that we know so well. We have seen them now hundreds of times. They are not so much lines as marks. Under the skin the life no longer pulses. It has already pressed out the boundaries of the body. Death is working through from within. It already has command in the eyes. Here lies our comrade Kimmerich, who a little while ago was roasting horse flesh with us and squatting in the shell holes. He it is still, and yet it is not he any longer. His features have become uncertain, faint, like a photographic plate from which two pictures have been taken. His voice sounds like ashes. I think of the time when we went away. His mother, a good plump matron, brought him to the station. She wept continually. Her face was bloated and swollen. Kimmerich felt embarrassed, for she was the least composed of all. She simply dissolved into fat and water. She caught sight of me and took hold of my arm again and again and implored me to look after Franz out there. Indeed, he did have a face like a child and such frail bones that after four weeks pack-carrying, he already had flat feet. But how can a man look after anyone in the field? Now you'll soon be going home, says Krop. You would have had to wait at least three or four months for your leave. Kimmerich nods. I cannot bear to look at his hands. They are like wax. Under the nails is the dirt of the trenches. It shows through, blue-black like poison. It strikes me that these nails will continue to grow like lean, fantastic cellar plants long after Kimmerich breathes no more. I see the picture before me. They twist themselves into corkscrews and grow and grow, and with them the hair under the decaying skull, just like grass and good soil, just like grass. How can it be possible? Muller leans over. We brought your things, Franz. Kimmerich signs with his hands. Put them under the bed. Muller does so. Kimmerich starts on again about the watch. How can one calm him without making him suspicious? Muller reappears with a pair of airman's boots. They are fine English boots of soft yellow leather 
which reach to the knees and lace up all the way. They are things to be coveted. Muller is delighted at the sight of them. He matches their soles against his own clumsy boots and says, Will you be taking them with you then, Franz? We all three have the same thought. If he even should get better, he would be able to use only one. They are of no use to him. But as things are now, it is a pity that they should stay here. The orderlies will of course grab them as soon as he is dead. Won't you leave them with us? Muller repeats. Kimmerich doesn't want to. They are his most prized possessions. Well, we could exchange, suggests Muller again. Out here, one can make some use of them. Still, Kimmerich is not to be moved. I tread on Muller's foot. Reluctantly, he puts the fine boots back again under the bed. We talk a little more and then take our leave. Cheerio, Franz. I promise him to come back in the morning. Muller talks of doing so, too. He is thinking of the lace-up boots. It means to be on the spot. Kimmerich groans. He is feverish. We get hold of an orderly outside and ask him to give Kimmerich a dose of morphia. He refuses. If we were to give morphia to everyone, we would have to have tubs full. You only attend to officers properly, says Krupp viciously. I hastily intervene and give him a cigarette. He takes it. Are you usually allowed to give it then? I ask him. He is annoyed. If you don't think so, then why do you ask? I press a few more cigarettes into his hand. Do us the favor. Well, all right, he says. Krupp goes in with him. He doesn't trust him and wants to see. We wait outside. Muller returns to the subject of the boots. They would fit me perfectly. In these boots I get blister after blister. Do you think he'll last till tomorrow after drill? If he passes out in the night, we know where the boots... Crop returns. Do you think? He asks. Done for, said Muller emphatically. We go back to the huts. I think of the letter that I must write tomorrow to Kimmerich's mother. I'm freezing. I could do with a tot of rum. Muller pulls up some grass and chews it. Suddenly, little Crop throws his cigarette away, stamps on it savagely, and looking around him with a broken and distracted face, stammers, Damn shit! The damn shit! We walk on for a long time. Crop has calmed himself. We understand. He saw red. Out there, every man gets like that sometime. What has Cantorek written to you? Muller asks him. He laughs. We are the Iron Youth. We all three smile bitterly. Crop rails. He is glad that he can speak. Yes, that's the way they think. These hundred thousand cantoracs. Iron Youth. Youth. We are none of us more than twenty years old, but young. Youth? That is long ago. We are old folk.